Welcome back. This is part two of a video discussing the teaching of indigenous Maori science in New Zealand classrooms. If you haven't seen part one yet, please go check that out so that you're not lost. The link is below. In my previous video, I talked about the letter in defense of science that actually agreed with the New Zealand government that science has been used as a tool to aid in the subjugation, subjugation of indigenous people worldwide. Now let's talk about their other claim, the idea that Mataranga Māori is fine as culture, but severely lacking as science. As I understand it, uh, Mataranga really does encompass the entire base of Māori knowledge. So as with Western Christian culture, that means that there are going to be these myths and legends in there that aren't empirically true. Again, I've combed through the New Zealand government's documents, and I cannot find anywhere that they advocate for teaching those myths and legends in the science classroom. Only statements like this found in the slightly more detailed initial recommendation from early 2020, ensuring that where possible and appropriate, Te Ao Māori and Matarango Māori are built into achievement standards for use across English and Māori medium settings. That might mean having Māori-centered contexts for exemplars and assessment resources, e.g. local iwi history, designing more inclusive standards and assessment resources that allow for diverse cultural perspectives on what's important, e.g. considering community or hapu impact, not just individual user needs. So where possible and appropriate. That sounds good to me. Um, some things are appropriate to teach in the science classroom, some things are not. So if you take the letter writer's word for it, of course, nowhere in science class is Mataranga appropriate. Is that true though? Uh, the Māori arrived in New, uh, New Zealand from other islands in the early 1300s using oceanic canoes and navigating via the stars. Considering that the Polynesian people all told settled, you know, New Zealand, Samoa, Tahiti, Hawaii, uh, Rapa Nui, across 5,000 or more miles of ocean, Either they had an incredibly detailed knowledge of the stars, tides, waves, construction, birds, marine life, or they were the luckiest humans to ever exist, just flopping around the Pacific for a thousand years as birds dropped fresh fish into their mouths until they eventually bump into a volcano here and there. But no, in fact, they used trial and error and the scientific method to develop canoes that could travel vast distances, fishing methods that allowed survival for long stretches at sea, and a compass that was divided into segments that they would carve onto canoes, allowing navigators to find their way depending upon the movement of the sun and stars. They played, they paid very close attention to celestial movements. Once they reached New Zealand, the Māori could only survive again through the scientific method. Waka Oturangi was one of the first to settle the islands and she brought important seeds with her to ensure survival. But it turns out that the climate of New Zealand was a lot colder than where she came from. So she ended up traveling around New Zealand, experimenting with various plants in order to find food and medicine, eventually building a garden of species that she found advantageous to human survival called Hawaiki Nui. These aren't myths or legends. These are tales of science and human ingenuity in the face of overwhelming odds, just as valid as tales of other important scientific breakthroughs like the ability of Europeans to travel across oceans or the development of vaccines or the creation of the internal combustion engine. Mataranga isn't just relegated to the ancient history of science either. I stumbled upon this great response to the Defense of Science letter by Scott Hamilton, who I assume is the figure skater, that describes a New Zealand doctor in World War II turning to the Māori for help fighting dysentery in allied soldiers. For centuries, Māori had used koromiko to treat stomach disorders. The plant's use was part of rongoa Māori, or Māori medicine. Knowledge of koromiko and other flora was passed on at Warwanaga, traditional schools. Downs remembered how the Māori soldiers had made tea from their dried koromiko. 
offering some of the brew to Pakeha comrades. The Anzacs had reported that the tea calmed their stomachs, preventing diarrhea. Hamilton goes on to describe the importance of Maori sailors in that same time period who had the ability to read the ocean, and also how their canoes proved more adept at navigating tricky waterways compared to the rubber rafts that were given to American GIs. He concludes with this paragraph, which I think is just a perfect summation for this entire thing. Today, the indigenous scholars of the Pacific draw on traditional knowledge as well as the research traditions of the West. Like Rupert Downs in 1942, scientists continue to find value in traditional plant knowledge. Last November, C.C. Molimau Samasoni, a scholar at the Scientific Research Organization of Samoa, made news around the medical world when she published a study showing that the leaves of the matalafi tree, which grows in yards across the country, was as effective as ibuprofen at reversing inflammation. In an interview, Molimau Samasoni said that her study had proved the scientific merit of the traditional healers who had used matalafi for centuries. Samoans have also traditionally used matalafi leaves leaves to chase ghosts away. Malomau Samasoni is not planning to investigate this practice. Like her Western counterparts, she is able to distinguish between the supernatural and scientific parts of her culture. And there it is. We're back to it. Where possible and appropriate. No one is claiming that one entire culture beats Western science and medicine, you know? All they're saying is, hey, we have thousands of years of knowledge based on empirical research that has by and large been buried. Why don't we try teaching high schoolers some of this? Students and scientists and everyone really uh, around the world would benefit from this knowledge, but it is particularly necessary in New Zealand schools. Time and time again, research shows us that people feel more engaged in an activity, more interested in learning, more inspired to pursue a career when they can see themselves represented in those things. You know, brave outliers forge that first path and then it gets easier and easier for even very marginalized people to think, oh, hey, yeah, I can do that. So, you know, imagine you're a Maori teen. If the only way you see your culture represented is in art or dance, you're more likely to think that that's where you belong. And conversely, that you do not belong in science and technology. And that is bonkers considering the incredible breadth of scientific knowledge your ancestors built to maintain and pass along down through the generations. The only reason you now think you don't belong in that space is because European colonizers did everything in their power to put a halt to that otherwise unbroken line of historical knowledge using techniques like the Tohunga Suppression Act of 1907, which threatened fines and imprisonment for every person who gathers Maoris around him by practicing on their superstition or credulity, or who misleads or attempts to mislead any Maori by professing or pretending to possess supernatural powers in the treatment or cure of any disease, or in the foretelling of future events or otherwise." Now, to a skeptic, that sounds quite rational and well-intentioned until you realize that it was used to stop the sharing of traditional medicine, which was at the time starting to lose its efficacy due to the arrival of new diseases that came along with European colonists, making previously effective medicine seem like quackery, almost like that's happened before, repeatedly. On that note, uh, this is worth hammering home. This isn't just a problem for New Zealand. You know, colonizers have done this to indigenous people all across the globe, including right here in my lovely state of California. Northern tribes like the Karuk uh, were stewards of this land for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. And during that time, they prevented major wildfires by practicing controlled burns that removed highly flammable litter from the forest floor without destroying the old growth trees. The American government outlawed this seemingly barbaric practice of purposely setting fires in the early 20th century, although they tried to stop it for centuries prior. 
Thanks to that misguided assumption and thanks to Western industrialization leading to climate change, California is now terrorized by fire season. Uh, a, a month or two every year when we all huddle inside with the windows closed and a go bag packed just in case we have to flee our homes from the next big wildfire. Our governor has just this month announced Whoops, turns out you guys were right. And also, could you like go back to doing that, please? And also, could you maybe teach us to do that too? Had our murderous ancestors simply paused and thought, hey, maybe they're doing that for a reason, let's ask them. Um, A whole lot of drama could have been avoided. But like the writers of the letter in defense of science, they just kind of assumed they knew better. And that's a shame, Uh, not just for the indigenous people that we killed and displaced and tried to breed out of existence, but for all of us, you know, for the entire knowledge base that we as humans have been building. If we really are the universe becoming sentient and learning about itself, then we got to do better. If you're interested in learning more about Mataranga, uh, there are a few more things that I didn't get around to explicitly mentioning, but you might find them interesting. Like this overview from 2016 by Dr. Daniel Hikuroa of University of Auckland, who writes that hitherto mostly ignored or disregarded by the science community because it seemed to be myth and legend, fantastic and implausible, Mataranga Maori includes knowledge generated using techniques consistent with the scientific method, but explains according to a Maori worldview. And then there's this special issue of the New Zealand Journal of Marine and Freshwater Research that goes in depth on the, quote, enormous potential for the use of Mataranga Maori to more widely enhance the understanding of aquatic ecosystems, underpin culturally appropriate restoration approaches, and provide a more holistic and integrated perspective for activity in this realm, including research, monitoring, planning, and policy and resource development. Then there's this paper, which is is about how Maori knowledge in particular can help researchers understand the unique geomorphology of New Zealand and how indigenous knowledge in general can help other scientists around the world with that topic. Here's a paper published last year in Nature that more generally argues for the decolonization of ecology, summing up that ecology as a discipline and the diversity of those who call themselves ecologists have also been shaped and held back by often exclusionary Western approaches to knowing and doing ecology. To overcome these historical constraints and to make ecology inclusive of the diverse peoples inhabiting Earth's varied ecosystems, ecologists must expand their knowledge, both in theory and practice, to incorporate varied perspectives, approaches, and interpretations from, with, and within the natural environment and across global systems. Finally, I really loved this calm and rational discussion amongst Maori scientists responding to that letter from their own independent perspectives, including an an astronomer who addresses the whole teaching creationism for the first time that I could find. Uh, He says this. And I think there is a racial, political and social agenda by a group of people who are spreading a little bit of fear. The likes of, oh my God, these Maori are going to come into our classrooms and replace the periodic table with a karakia, or remove the Bunsen burner and put a haka in its place. There is no attack from indigenous people on the on, on science, on what we understand to be modern Western science. But there is more than one way to understand something. Mm. That's the point that we're coming across here. There is some real learning to be had within indigenous knowledge. And we are always open to share. We're not imposing something, another way of knowing, another way of learning, uh, another approach to wisdom upon another group of people. That was done to us. So please don't say to us, you know, you're imposing your ways that aren't proper knowledge upon us. And it, it undermines. I mean, like, if Māori say, oh, everything began in a small place of Rangi and Papa and was exploded outwards and that created, you know, and he talked about cosmology and, oh, that's myths and legends. But when it's a singularity and a big bang, it's, it's science. Mm. Same as, you know, uh, when we say we've got genealogy to stars. And I say, how ridiculous is that? And now everything begins its life in the star, every molecule and everything that makes up the entire world. When it's done from a Western perspective, it's scientific truth. And when it's an indigenous idea, it's myths and legends, and it undermines what we do. I found that really interesting because I sort of disagree with him here. You know, there is a difference between scientific observations and a creation myth that we can 
post hoc metaphorically relate to what we scientifically know about the universe. But I do find uh, it thought provoking um, how these myths were developed and what real observations were they based on. You know, personally, I would love to see something like that explored in science class, just as in my own science classes growing up, you know, as a teenager, we talked about whether or not there's scientific evidence of a great flood that inspired the story in the Bible. You know, what would that look like? Do we have the evidence? As a young Christian, that really drew me in. It made me want to learn more about the science. And as someone who's always loved learning about the myths and legends of other cultures, I'm now equally fascinated by how they might have developed based on what these people were experiencing thousands and thousands of years ago. I'm going to end this video here, but do know that there's a whole lot more happening with this to do. Uh, the reason why people are still talking about it today is because some people complained about the academics who wrote that letter. Uh, there was an investigation into the letter writers. Some people resigned from their jobs. Other people are claiming that they're being harassed. I'm not going to get into any of that because this video is already abnormally long for me. Like, what am I, H Bomber guy talking about how Conker's Bad Fur Day is the underrated video game of the century? No, it, this video does not need to be that long. So my apologies for the length of this video, uh, but as an outsider, I really just wanted to take my time to go over as much of the research as possible, give you as much context as possible for what kicked all of this off. Because I think it's easy for white, Western, science-loving atheists like myself to dismiss mysterious ways of knowing other than science. And it's easy to have a knee-jerk reaction to the idea of teaching creationism in the classroom. But honestly, it's not just wrong, it's boring, you know? There's this whole wide world of weirdness out there, and I encourage you all to dig into it, find out what it's really all about, um, keep an open mind, just, you know, not so open that your brain falls out.